Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church in Bend, Oregon. My name is Stephen, the lead pastor here at First Presbyterian, and I'm really glad and happy to welcome you. You know, every time we gather together, whether it be online, on television, or in person, we try our best to welcome one another, you know, just as God loves us, without condition. No matter who you are, where you're from, where you live, no matter what your family looks like, no matter your ethnicity of origin for your family, no matter how you identify, who you love, who you vote for, or where you are at on your spiritual journey, we try our best to welcome each other as God loves us, without conditions. We celebrate at First Presbyterian a spacious faith, where there is space for absolutely everyone. So please know your presence today is a real gift. And we're really grateful that we're able to gather and connect together in this way. Today we're excited to have as our guest bringing the message the Reverend Brian Heron. Brian is the Presbyter for Vision and Mission for the Presbytery of the Cascades. Now for those not in the know of the Presbyterian Church USA, Presbytery is the regional body that supports congregations throughout the state. Now, Brian has served in this presbytery for, for nearly two decades, specializing in interim and in transformational ministry. He has a deep personal commitment to the Presbyterian Church USA. As the church really provided an emotional home for him in his childhood, and at the same time, much of Brian's spiritual life is rooted in experiencing God in nature, cycling, hiking, snowshoeing, kayaking. We're really grateful that Brian is leading worship with us today. And believe me, you're gonna really appreciate what he has to say. Now, as we turn our hearts to worship, take a deep breath with me. <sighs> Lower your shoulders. You know how our shoulders creep up to our ears? Lower your shoulders. Soften your forehead. You know, soften that space between your, between your eyebrows where we tend to frown. Ah, loosen and release any tension in your jaw. Take a deep breath. Another deep breath. And, uh, Allow your breath to drop from the tightness in our chest down to your belly. May we create space in our worship today to be truly present to the presence of God's love in such a way that it just might change the way we are present in the world. Friends, welcome. Oh, creatures of our God and King, lift up Voice and with a sing. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Thou burning with golden beams, thou silver. Softer clean Hallelujah 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 So strong, he. 
clouds that sail in heaven long. Alleluia, alleluia. Thou rising morning, praise rejoice. He taking care of your heart lately. In the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, there's a verse that says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. 
I wonder, what does that mean to guard our hearts? I like to think of it as taking care of the very core of ourselves. And right now, while things are still so uncertain and we might feel scared or worried or sad, it seems more important than ever to be taking care of our hearts. That way, what flows out of our hearts, the things that we do, are things of love. Not things that we do just because we're upset or afraid or just trying to be in control in some way. And while it might be nice if we just had a button we could push and suddenly make everything go the way that we wanted it to, that isn't real life, is it? Sometimes the best we can do is stop and pay attention to what it is that we really need. So what does it look like for you to take care of your heart? Maybe it's doing something you love doing. Maybe it's spending time with a loved one or doing something for someone in need, like donating food or showing kindness. Maybe it's as simple as noticing the beauty around you and saying a prayer of thanks. Now, none of this will just make the hard things go away, but I think it can help make our hearts feel a little bit bigger, help us worry less about what we can't control and focus instead on what we can change, ourselves. It reminds us that we are part of something bigger, that we can be a part of God's great work of love in the world. And sometimes that means showing love even to ourselves. So I hope this week you'll stop and ask yourself, how can I take care of my heart? Or how can I take care of someone else's heart? What beauty can I find or offer to bring light and hope to the world around me? Oh, divine healer, we confess that sometimes we yearn for you to wave a magic wand on our wounded lives, to remove our pain, illness, and suffering. We hear the gospel story of the one seeking healing from Jesus and assume you will perform a similar miracle for all of us. If we just pray hard enough, and we do pray, open our eyes to recognize the teachings and tools you have given us with which to seek healing. In the midst of our afflictions and diseases, you whisper to us that wholeness requires self-care and rest. You nudge us toward caregivers who can support and advise us. You breathe into us energy to move and stretch and reach toward health. You place in us an urgency to seek justice so that all may enjoy adequate health, care. Renew our spirits in the midst of our diseases and afflicting spirits. Transform us, O oh Holy One, for the health of your creation. Amen. Les 
Gracious and loving God, there is not a moment that we do not belong to you. You claim us as your beloved from beginning to end. Reassured and emboldened by this good news, we pray this day, knowing nothing separates us from you and your love for us. God of mercy, so much is happening in our nation and world. From mass shootings to climate change, to political divide, to our own personal grief. Do not let us be immobilized or numbed by our fear or anxiety and anguish. Come alongside us so we do not feel so alone. May we find concrete ways to denounce violence and become peacemakers. Holy Spirit, keep watch over all those who have been uprooted from home, who seek safety in unfamiliar, even inhospitable places. Keep watch over those who cannot escape difficult circumstances. Keep watch over those who have nowhere to go. Make your presence known to the many people displaced because of war. Be with those who leave their homelands in search for a better life. Scripture tells us to welcome the stranger. Christ, who was a refugee, spoke of a welcome that was more than tolerance or passive acceptance. So help us to make room for others in our hearts and homes and lives as he made room for us. 
and be with those who live with mental illness. Surround them with people who care and support them. Help them to live life fully and joyfully and comfort those who wait for a diagnosis or who have already received scary news from their doctor. Give them hope for tomorrow. Holy One, so much seems irreconcilable in our families, our homes, our nation and creation. Let us turn over to you whatever feels insurmountable or impossible in our lives. Continue to remind us that your love and grace have no end. Christ, keep expanding our capacity to love one another so we may recognize you every place we go and in everyone we meet. Help us to love the world as fiercely and tenderly as you do. Hear us as we pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Bible readings today begin with the Hebrew scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 to 8. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. And the Gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 30 to 38. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone Jesus. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me 
a blasphemy because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the Father. This is the Word of God for the people of God. High on this mountain, the clouds down below, I'm feeling so strong and alive. From this rocky perch, I'll continue to search for the wind and the snow and the sky. I want a lover, I want some friends, and I want to live in the sun, and I want to do all the things that I never have done. Off in the Netherlands, I heard a sound, like the beating of heavenly wings, and deep in my brain, I can hear a refrain of my soul as she rises and sings. Anthems to glory and anthems to love, and hymns filled with earthly delight, like the songs that the darkness composes to worship the light. Those are the lyrics from Dan Fogelberg's song, Netherlands. I'm sitting here atop Angel's Rest in the Columbia Gorge after making a 2.5 mile romp of a somewhat steep trail from the Columbia River Gorge. And you know, I can't imagine a better place to preach a sermon about falling in love with God. For the signs of God are all around me and in me. The river 1,600 feet below, Portland on the distant horizon, the sun almost beginning to set, and of course my body buzzing with the vitality of hiking and being in motion and being one with the mountain. I do feel especially alive when I'm up in places like this. I want to let you know that I'm preaching this sermon really with two hats on. I'm preaching it as the executive presbyter for the Presbytery of the Cascades, a region of 98 churches in Western Oregon and Southwest Washington. And I'm also preaching it as a person who could best describe his relationship with God as a love affair but first wearing my hat as an executive. A big part of why I'm preaching this sermon is to start paving the way toward the return to our ancient religious mysticism. Millions of people today think of themselves as spiritual but not religious. And even though we might consider it a new development, to my trained eyes as a student of religious history, it appears that what is actually happening is that the ancient tradition of religious mysticism, something that we've almost completely forgotten, seems to be returning. So what is a religious mystic or a spiritual mystic? Simply put, it's a person who longs for, who yearns for, or as the psalmist says, pants for, I love that particular interpretation, who pants for a direct experience of God or the sacred. It is a person who is not satisfied with adherence to doctrinal and creedal statements. You see, a mystic is less interested in a belief in God and more interested in a lived out, embodied experience of God. I'm also sharing this sermon as a person whose faith can best be described as a lifelong love affair with God or a mystical orientation to my life. I have to admit that I have at times been a bit of a puzzlement to the institutional church. Most of us who serve the church talk about our love for the church, but I have to admit that the church has always come second for me. It's my love affair with God that has always come first. It just happens to be that I've been able to express my lifelong love affair with God, mostly by serving in the church. And because of that, my life, looks to some as if I haven't planned well or used good judgment at times. 
You see, I did not get this executive position through the usual climbing of the professional career ladder. Rather, I got here by following this passion that I have for God, which sometimes have brought me sweet success and sometimes even abject failure. But I've always followed my passion, and that has sometimes led to living in low-income housing and being on food stamps, but also it's led me to being on Mount Everest. I've truly been on the top and the bottom. But the one consistent thread in my life has been this wonderful and troubling love affair with God. Wonderful and troubling. You know, I think those words capture the interchange between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day as, found, as is found in this scripture from John. As we pick up the story, those religious leaders were gathering stones to kill Jesus for the sin of blasphemy. And you can see where they got their evidence. Jesus was making such assertions as, I and, the fa I and the Father are one, and the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. In other words, he was making himself equal with God, putting himself on the same level as God. And to conventional thinking, this is very problematic, even heretical and blasphemous. But you know what? It depends on how one sees God. 25 years ago, I remember being at a workshop taught by a fairly well-known New Testament professor, and he was working through this same text. And a few minutes into his lecture, as he was setting himself up for his teaching moment, he turned to the 30 of us at the workshop and asked us all to raise our hand, hands if, he, if we agreed that making yourself equal to God would be considered blasphemous. Now, I didn't actually count the hands, but I'm quite sure that I was the only one who did not raise my hand. And the professor noticed that, and he asked, so is there anyone here who disagrees with that statement? And I sort of timidly raised my hand, and the professor asked me to explain myself. And I responded, well, professor, it depends on whether you see God in a vertical relationship or a horizontal relationship. And I will never forget how the pastor stared at me for a bit and then turned away. What had happened was that I had just short-circuited his lecture. And a half hour later, he finished his lecture saying, the charge of blasphemy here only comes from those who see God in a vertical relationship. At Bend First Presbyterian Church, you have this wonderful open-ended approach to Christian community called Spacious Christianity. And what I love about your congregation is that you make room for the various ways that people connect with their faith, understand the relationship with Jesus, and honor the place for God and the sacred in their lives. And one of those ways that seems to be getting more traction both within the church and, the, and beyond the church is the way of mysticism. You see, mystics tend to see God more as a horizontal relationship with God rather than a vertical relationship. So when you listen to folks who land more on the mystical side of faith, you will hear them speak less of loving God and more of being in love with God. Over a hundred years ago, G.K. Chesterton an English writer, art critic, philosopher, and lay theologian got this when he said, let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love affair. Isn't that marvelous? Let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love affair. And 1,500 years before him, St. Augustine said, to fall in love is the greatest romance. Oh my gosh, isn't that great? To fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek him the greatest adventure, to find him the greatest achievement. Romance, adventure, and achievement. 
My friends, that's the kind of faith that I get up in the morning for. Now, I do want to be very careful to make the point that the mystical approach to God is not the one right approach. It's just one approach that many of us today have found is the most authentic and life-giving for us. Frederick Beekner, a Presbyterian pastor and writer, writes that all doctrines actually start with a mystical experience. What's happening today is that many of us are trying to return to the mystical experience that is the source of the doctrines of the church. A few years ago, I preached a sermon about the difference between religion as a moral foundation and religion as a mystical experience. In fact, you often can't tell the difference between a person who does things out of a sense of moral obligation and the person who does the same thing as an expression of their mystical connection. The difference is not in the act itself, but in what motivates the person. Take, for instance, the person who's being helped alongside the road, as in the Good Samaritan story. You see, the moralist tends to lend aid because God has said that we ought to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's just simply the right thing to do, correct? But the mystic lends the same aid because in so doing they believe that they are experiencing the presence of God in that intimate connection. It's the same action, but different motivation. Simply put, the moralist lives a faithful life carrying out the greatest commandment to love God and to love neighbor. And the mystic lives a faithful life because in their core of cores, they believe like Jesus, that I and the Father are one, that the Father is in me and I am in the Father and that there is nothing more satisfying than being in the actual pulsating presence of God in the world. We hear language like this as new forms of spirituality emerge in our communities, that we are one with all beings and all things, that God is in us and we are in God, and even that each one of us is actually made up of particles of stardust. And maybe some of that language sounds a bit woo-woo to you, but you know what? I think it's only a modern version of what Jesus said, that I and the Father are one, and that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. It's the actual taste of God that drives the mystic. It's the feeling that our heartbeat is actually God's heartbeat, that motivates the mystic, just like two lovers who become one flesh. But before you fall for this hook, line, and sinker, I want to provide a warning. You see, seeing God as your lover can be dangerous. Bruce Coburn captured this well in his song, Lovers in a Dangerous Time, and he writes, when your lover is in a dangerous time, sometimes you're made to feel as if your love's a crime. Nothing worth having comes without some kind of fight. You gotta kick at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. Sometimes you're made to feel as if your love's a crime. In other words, sometimes people might be uncomfortable with you or ignore you or ridicule you or ostracize you or avoid you. Or like in our scripture lesson today, they might even threaten to throw rocks at you. You see, the thing about love affairs is that they're messy. They're unpredictable. They don't follow the rules of convention. They're problematic for institutional structures. The reason is because love affairs are based on passion and yearning and longing or like the psalmist says, a panting for experience. Love affairs are up and they are down, and one day they propel you to the height of human experience and the next day to the depth of despair. 
Love affairs tell the story of both ecstasy as well as volatility. Love affairs make room for the full breadth of human experience. For when we fall deeply in love, we can't help but to commit to that person in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health. Which reminds me of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, whose author just had to have been a mystic. Listen for how the author doesn't just limit the experience of God to all of the, quote, good things in life, but how the author makes room for the full experience of life, just like a good, passionate love affair. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, under heaven, a time to be born, but oh, also a time to die, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, but also a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and thank God a time to dance, a time to embrace, yes, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek but also a time to let go and to lose, a time to tear. Wow, that hurts. A time to tear or be torn and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak. My friends, love, real love is messy, but it's also rich in experience, rich in life and rich in God. I will close with a quote from Pedro Arupe, a 20th century Jesuit priest who was serving as a missionary in Hiroshima when the atomic bomb was dropped on that city. He writes this, nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in a quite absolute final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love. Stay in love. And it will decide everything. I and the Father are one. God is in me, and I am in God. God is in you, and you are in God. Amen. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you.
know, it says in the book of Genesis that we are blessed so that we might be a blessing to others. The generosity of your giving makes a huge difference, impacts and blesses so many lives. You know, the blessing of, of your generosity makes it possible for our worship service to reach people across the world. The blessing of your generosity helps us be a strong presence of love and generosity at a time when, when so many are struggling, so many are hurting. The blessing of your generosity helps us care for the sick, comfort the grieving, feed the hungry, house the homeless, nurture and encourage children and young people, offer sanctuary and hope for people in recovery, support those struggling with mental health issues, and so much more. The blessing of your generosity truly, truly blesses the lives of so many. You know, our income over the summer drops, but unfortunately, people's needs and struggles are rising right now. The blessing of your generosity is especially needed this summer to help us continue to bless others. I ask you, if you're able, to please give generously. It's easy to make a gift. You can, you can give online at bendfp.org, or you can write a check and send it to the church. Every gift, large or small, makes a huge difference. Your generosity, your generosity is a blessing. And thank you. Thank you for the many ways that you bless others. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently. Here's the view of coming down from Angel's Rest at sunset. It's a glorious evening. My blessing is this. And now my friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Repay no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor everyone and love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and do all of this, not just because it's right, but because that's what lovers do. Peace to y'all. It's all around